Hey, Yorick. Oh, hey, Mark. Okay, so here we are, a bit of an accident behind us, but we're just uh, in Shenzhen at the moment. We've just come back from Guangdong province where yep. we checked out the eye store factory. The eye store heat pump factory. Where they uh, assemble the heat pump. The right. heat pump hot water systems, yeah. Yeah. And we got a private tour with the factory manager yeah. and May, who's the sales manager. I don't know if you understand how lucky we've been on this tour, like uh, different factories that we've been at. Normally yeah. on a tour, it's like 15 people. Yeah. And, you know, you're trying to push your way into the front of the queue. This time we had two super intelligent people and we could just spit questions at them and they answered all of it. Yeah, so they really knew so. what they were talking about, which was great. I reckon we spent like, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half on the factory floor. And we got to great. see yeah. all the prop parts of those they came in and as they were assembled and on the way out. And we'll take you through those steps. But Mark, a heat pump, what, what is that basically? So a heat pump, in really simple terms, it's basically a reverse cycle air conditioner, right? So, But instead of the reverse cycle air conditioner heating up your room, it heats up your hot water. Okay. So let's go through really quickly because what we did on the factory floor is we saw basically the different parts get assembled, you know, yeah. of, of how a heat pump is actually working. Yeah. Can you give us a quick rundown? Yeah. So oh, look, a heat so. pump is basically, there's four cycles of a heat pump. We've got a room temperature refrigerant that goes into a evaporator. So it gets goes through a tiny little hole, almost like squeezing an uh, aerosol can. It gets really cold. Uh, and it gets warmed up by passing through a radiator, and now it's at room temperature. Mm. It then goes into a pump, and it gets compressed back into a liquid, and that's a really hot liquid, a little bit almost like if you've got a bike pump, and you pumped it up really hard, that bike pump's going to get hot quick. Yep. That hot liquid then goes around the tank along the outside, and that heat in and gets transferred into the hot water, heating it up, yep. and then it comes out at basically room temperature again before start, starting the cycle back through the evaporator, compressor, condenser, and the cycle keeps going. Yeah, yeah. And so the factory tour was really cool. Like at the first part, we were checking out, you know, the printed circuit boards and things like that. Probably a little bit too detailed for us to go into here. And we didn't get any photos of that as well. While we're there, they were gracious enough to take photos of all the things that we wanted as well. Yeah. So the, let's start with the first obvious step, which is the tank. Yeah. Okay. So they've got two types of tanks. iStore specifically uses a steel vitreous tank, which is basically a steel tank with a glass lining on the inside. And at home, and they also had some uh, stainless steel tanks. And I think you've got a stainless steel tank. I've got a stainless tank at home too. So, yeah, there's two different options of tanks. Yeah. Stainless, a lot of people... Well, what they said actually is the reason that a lot of people go stainless in Europe is because they use the hot water tap to drink. Yeah, um, it seems barbaric to me. Well, I don't know. We In China, you don't normally drink tap water. In yeah. Australia, we do. I just don't drink I, I like to boil water, a kettle. You know, I, don't, I don't get it straight out of the or, tap. Yeah, or a zip tap or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so they believe this, the stainless steel is just cleaner, which yeah. it probably is if you're going to drink the water, you know. Maybe if you're drinking the hot water. But I think when I put my hot water system, I was actually told I wasn't allowed to have a stainless steel tape because my water in Ipswich is a bit too hard. It's got too much calcium in the water. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how accurate this is. I just want to point out, I'm not the expert on this, all right? So I'll challenge you on inverters, but yeah. if you you can challenge me on this if you're the plumber or something. Yeah. But the stainless tanks, the welds can break, apparently, yeah. especially when you start heating them up a lot. That, that can be a weak point. Enamel, again, is more cost-effective and I think just a really good, sensible way of making a stainless Almost tank. all water tanks sold in Brisbane will be enamel tanks. We looked at the enamel tank first and they get that in from one of their partners you know yeah. uh, you know a company that they've got shares in so it's not not as if they're just outsourcing everything you know yeah and they get that tank in they do that first part and they wrap your coil around it they wrap right? the so. uh, yeah the condenser coils around the outside of the tank and uh, what i found was really interesting is it was there's two options when yep. it comes to the condenser coil so there's two main tanks that we buy from iStore one is a 180 liter tank and one is a 270 liter tank. 270 is going to be most common. Yeah, most people will get the mm. 270. Mm. The interesting thing was with the 270, they use the micro channel condenser, whereas with the 180, they use the copper condenser. Copper condenser is sort of the most obvious. Basically, your copper pipe at home, mm. they're wrapping that around the tank. So copper is more expensive for a start, but also you don't have as much conductivity because you've got that round pipe onto a flat surface. Yeah. So this micro channel was a really cool looking... Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's almost like a ribbon pipe where you've got lots of little channels running along along it and it's a flat surface and they basically use an electrically conductive glue to glue that piping onto the tank so there's a lot more surface area and a bit more better heat transfer so possibly a little bit more efficient that was really cool to see so i guess that's our second step right you get the tank and you put the coil around it for that heat transfer part right then obviously you don't want your hot water to escape so they basically put a metal sleeve on the tank and then they basically fill in all the gaps with a uh, expanding foam, which was polyurethane. Yeah, polyurethane foam. You know, you can get polyurethane glue, you know, Sikaflex. Uh, or you can get 
foam filler. Um, you know that big can that just to say rats can't get in your house or something like yeah. that. You know, so it was a basically foam filler, poly- polyurethane expanding foam that they pump into it. Like it's it's a very common filling material. It's it's it basically makes sure there's no gaps. You know, you want to keep that hot water in overnight. You don't want your hot water escaping. Yeah, wrapping a big blanket around. Yeah. it kind of. Yeah. And so we've yeah. got a tank, and then what we have to add is the heat pump component. And um, anyway, so what they do is we they they assemble the evaporator, the compressor, uh, the fan goes in. Uh, the thing that I thought was quite interesting is they almost all the parts except for the uh, compressor, which is coming from uh, Mitsubishi, and yep. fan, all the other parts were made in-house by partner companies. By yeah. partner companies, yeah not, yeah. not on that factory floor. This is really the assembly yeah. part of it we saw, right? So Yeah. yeah. So then the compressor yeah. goes on top, and I, it was the first time you saw a naked heat pump, Mark. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's kind of not what I do, but it was just kind of cool just to have the whole thing pulled apart, and you go... Ah, okay, now that makes sense. Penny yeah. drop moments. It's, it's <laughs> basically just like a little air conditioning compressor that sits, a little air conditioning system that sits on top of the tank. And so um, the testing they do is obviously a leak test, which is critical of both the refrigerant system, but also of the actual water system. The other things that they're testing for are uh, making sure all the sensors are working, the temperature's rising, they're hitting the targets of what they should expect, and it's not a faulty product on arrival. That testing part seemed to be a quite a slow process that they're doing one of these at a time, pumping it out. But anyway... By this stage, they pump it out. They whack a lovely big ice store sticker on the front of it. It's a good-looking heat pump. I it is, Mark. it is. And then they put a box around it, right? I, so. I wanted to sign one of the heat pumps because Mark's going to be getting an ice store yeah, soon. Who knows? It could be, yeah. In fact, I'm getting one at home because I want to check it out. I've got an old basic resistive element hot water tank because that's what I thought was the better option before. But Carl Jensen convinced me I was yeah. wrong. A heat pump is essentially an LED to an incandescent light globe. You know, instead of having a resistive element, it's just basically turning electricity into heat very relatively inefficiently you're using a pump to move heat from one spot to another and you can move far more heat for the same amount of energy yeah okay now let's talk about the refrigerant or the gases that they use right correct up until fairly recently Mm. um most companies were using it's r134a right yeah which is basically a um a fluorohexacarbon so it's incredibly damaging to the environment yeah yeah so it's good that in recent years they've moved away from that yeah. and now there's basically two options give us the two options that we've so got. we've got r290 which is essentially propane and mm. we've got um co2 i think it's r744 but don't quote me on that number co2 everyone calls it because yeah. everyone knows what co2 is co2 so, so propane is what iStore is using right Correct. and then other manufacturers use co2 as well yes there are a couple of premium um, brands that come from japan that use co2 i guess we could go through the steps so there was an improvement in efficiency going from 134a yep. uh, to the 290 yep. and along with being a much more environmentally friendly uh, gas yes um, so it was all around much better but it took a little while for the industry to actually move into that so basically what we were told is well propane is quite a commonly used gas since oh, yes. yeah. it, it, it is flammable compared to co2 and the the fluorocarbons the thing is is that look these are completely sealed systems. There's not a lot of gas in them. You know, it's not like a whole nine kilo gas bottle. Your barbecue tank or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these are incredibly safe cycles. So at the end of the day, it is much better for everybody using environmentally friendly uh, refrigerants. Yeah. Okay. Now let's compare and contrast, I guess, the differences between our CO2 mm. uh, My and heat our pump at home. Yeah. yeah. My heat pump at home is, is a Sandin. I think I've made that very clear uh, before. And um, But yeah, it, it is a CO2 compressor. Mm. Um, now, my understanding was that CO2 is a bit more efficient uh, compared to even R290, but I also may not have done the comparison properly at that time. Um, but the big reason I think CO2 is good is if you've got really extreme temperature changes. So if you, you know... Uh, in down Antarctica. In Tassie. Yeah. Well, Antar- <laughs> Antarctica, we might struggle. Uh, but like if you're living in Tassie, where it gets you know, below yeah, zero, yeah. Um, or you're in Dubai, where you've got really, really hot conditions, mm. uh, our sounding is uh, heat pumps are a lot more uh, efficient and a bit more stable in those conditions. Yeah, yeah. And from what I understand, when we get into Brisbane climates, when we get into more moderate climates, yeah, 25 you're really degrees. splitting hair as to which one's going to be more efficient. Um, I want to look a bit more into that. So can, let us know down in the comments below. Do you think it's true that... CO2 is much more efficient or is that maybe a myth when you're talking about more moderate climates? Yeah. So. I think it's very fair to say for at least in our conditions R290, it's more than good enough for the job. It's a lot cheaper to build with because you don't need as heavy duty components. You need far higher 
uh, compression temperatures mm. on CO2. So that means all your plumbing and your condensers and evaporators all have to be far more rugged and heavy. And, and this just adds to cost. And I think it's fair to say that I paid almost twice what I would pay for my Sandin. I paid twice for that. Well, the good, the good thing is if you move to Dubai or to Beijing, you'll be able to bring it with you and it'll still work. You know, so. It'll work really well. That's a good point. Today, we're heading off in, in just a few minutes yep. to BYD. Subscribe if you want to check out that. That's going to be it. I'm really looking forward to we're that. We're going to build tour. your dreams. It's uh, going to be a great tour, I think. But as far as heat pumps go, you, you know, a year ago or something when Carl um, won that debate with me and I con- was convinced to start using heat pumps, mm. um, even though uh, they may not last as long as a traditional hot water tank. I don't think that's fair to say. I mean, when we spoke to the ice store factory manager, he was confident that that, t- that compressor was going to last. Yeah, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. But I think, I think that it's going to save you so much money yeah. over that period that it's so much more worthwhile getting a heat pump and then replacing it. Oh, let's talk about the element in the heat pump. Oh, I completely forgot about that. Mm. My heat pump doesn't have an element in it. So what happens if my heat pump breaks? Yeah, yeah. You'll be calling me to run around on a Sunday to fix it. And I'll be like, bugger off, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the fact that it's got an uh, element backup in it, just in case something with a heat pump fails. It might be something that's really, really small, but then you can just whack on the element and heat up your tank. Let's say your compressor completely fails and you're like, I don't have the outlay to replace it with another heat pump. You could run it for a year with that element. Yeah. It'll take you longer to heat, but we did ask about common failure points and it's almost never the compressor that breaks. No, It's yeah, almost sure. always just the capacitor that needs replacing. Yeah, exactly. Or, or the circuit exactly. board, which can be replaced too. Well, and this is an advantage and this is sort of a reason why plumbers don't love heat pumps because they're, they're starting to deal with electrical products, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think it's why it's a really good... A part of the reason that I'm bringing it on um, is that I think it's, it's really... As much our domain it is, as it is a plumber's domain, yeah. we can understand these products, we can repair them. We're actually currently using another plumber to do the plumbing work of the installation. Yeah. Um, that'll, that'll change in years to come. We might bring a plumber on board and, you know, train our sparkies and get them licensed to do restricted plumbing as well. So. And so, um, look, we never like to say it, but like and subscribe. <laughs> Click the bell icon. Soon we'll have a BYD video out as well as another one on heat pumps. So, Mate, i got to go and pack up my bag because we're okay. heading to BYD. you got to go. All right. <laughs> okay, see ya. Thanks, Mark.